Welcome. In this presentation, I will review the death disorders asbestosis and silicosis. I will begin with an overview of the fate of dust particles within the lung, that is, where is dust deposited and how the lung clears and responds to dust particles. Then I will discuss the inorganic dust diseases silicosis and asbestosis. Dust diseases have been known since antiquity. The two essential forms of work, farming and hunting, expose workers to the harmful effects of dust from stored grain and dust from fashioning flint tools and weapons. All lungs accumulate dust, like the rings of a tree, the traces of a man's trade and habits are inscribed upon the lung. What's a dusty environment? Let's consider a coal mine, which contains approximately 800 to 1,000 particles per cubic millimeter. A coal miner will inhale between 100 to 150 grams of dust yearly. Of the dust inhaled, about 1 to 10 grams is deposited in the alveoli, but only about 0.5 grams is permanently retained. Over 40 years of working, this amounts to 20 grams, half as much as the weight of the normal dried lungs. Even though there is no physical filter between our lungs and the environment, Particles have difficulty reaching the lung. Protection is primarily afforded by the physics of air flow in the complex anatomy of the respiratory system, which can be arbitrarily broken down into three compartments, the nasopharyngeal, tracheobronchial conducting airways, and the pulmonary region, composed of the respiratory bronchioles and alveolar sacs. A large portion of the protection occurs in the nasopharynx. Airflow is directed through two 90-degree turns through the baffling system that terminates such that most particles, more than my 5 microns in size, are removed. Inertial impaction continues in the tracheobronchial airways as particles are directed to the airway wall or driven into bifurcation points. This effectively removes particles more than 5 microns in diameter. After running the gauntlet of the airways, the remaining particles reach the respiratory bronchioles and the alveoli. The respiratory unit has a large volume, 40 times that of the airways, and airflow nearly stops. Diffusion becomes the main driving force. Particles now can settle out of the airways, particularly in the respiratory bronchioles. Generally, only particles 1 to 3 microns in diameter can make it this far. Studying particulate deposition in the lungs is difficult. Animal models have different respiratory dynamics than the human lung. Computer modeling is difficult due to flow dynamics in irregularly branching tubes. Human studies are only feasible with radionuclide labeled particles. This particular setup can be used to study the dynamics of particles during smoking. What we know from studies such as this is that particle deposition follows the known distribution of pulmonary ventilation. That is, because of gravity, most particles will deposit it in the lower lobes. Thus, for every 1,000 particles deposited in the lower lung zones, 700 are deposited in the upper lung zones. Deposition is not the whole story. Particles once deposited are cleared. From the nasopharynx down to terminal of bronchiole, cilia are remarkably efficient in removing particulate material, such that at the level of the terminal bronchiole, the smallest ciliated airway in the lung, the clearance half-time is on the order of 100 minutes. If it takes four and one-half half-times to remove nearly all particles, then the conducting airways are cleared within eight hours. However, at the level of the respiratory bronchiole and alveoli, there are no cilia. Particles are absorbed into the lung or engulfed by macrophages, which make their way into the lung lymphatics. This removal is much slower, roughly 50 days, thus taking nearly a year to remove the particulate burden. Particles come in nearly all sizes and shapes. Most are rounded. Some are fibrous. A fiber is defined as a particle with an aspect ratio greater than 3. 
that is, the ratio of the long and short axis. The shape of a particle, irrespective of its chemical properties, plays an important role in clearance. Note that when fibers fragment, these particles may now fit into the rounded categories. Although the asbestos fiber, commonly more than 40 microns in length, would seem much too large to reach the respiratory bronchioles, the aerodynamic properties of the long thin fiber acts like a particle less than 5 microns in diameter. However, in contrast to small particles, which can be engulfed and removed by macrophages, the long asbestos fiber is much too long to, remo to be removed in this manner. In fact, the asbestos body is nothing more than the cellular reaction from a number of now dead macrophages which try to ingest and remove the asbestos fiber. Note that the respiratory bronchiole and alveolar unit are devoid of lymphatics. The lung lymphatics are composed of two systems, one along the bronchovascular bundle and the second peripheral system along the pulmonary veins. What happens to particles that reach the respiratory bronchioles? Well, they can be absorbed or engulfed by macrophages. Some are trapped forever. Those particles which can be engulfed by macrophages are removed through the lymphatics or migrate to the terminal bronchiole and escape via the cilia. As we've seen, removal of particles is slow. Lymphatic flow is, in part, determined by arterial pressure and respiratory motion, which aids lymphatic flow. Arterial pressure is non-uniform. The low-pressure pulmonary artery system is linearly affected by gravity. Normal pulmonary pressure is just sufficient to perfuse the apex of the lung. Thus, the driving pressure for lymphatic flow will diminish towards the lung apex. In addition, passive respiratory motion is non-uniform. The lung bases and the anterior lateral portion of the lung undergoes greater degree of respiratory expansion than the apices and dorsal aspect of the lung. Well, that's the theory of particle clearance. How does that work out in practice? The chronic retention of particulate material can be determined by autopsy examination of different elements. Even though the analyses involve different methods, the results are remarkably similar. Particles tend to accumulate over time in the upper lobes, approximately 1.25 times that of the lower lobes. I already suggested that fibers, because of their size, may be handled differently. Churg studied the distribution of amocyte in nine lungs, the circles proportionately representing the quantity studied. Similar to the rounded dusts, the concentration of asbestos particles is greatest in the upper lobes. However, the concentration of fibers, as measured by the aspect ratio, is greatest in the inferior aspect of the lung, again reflecting the inability of the lung to remove the long, thin fiber. Length, it turns out, is one physical aspect which determines the pathogenicity of the asbestos fiber. Because gravitational physiology is important in the distribution of dust particles in the lung, then the anatomical lobar analysis used in these investigations is the incorrect method. For example, in this sagittal section of the lung, the lower portion of the upper lobes and the upper portion of the lower lobe occupy the same gravitational plane. Thus, an analysis based on anatomic boundaries will blur the true distribution of particulate material in the lung. The correct analyses would breadloaf the lung, horizontal planes perpendicular to the gravitational axis. In this lung, mineral pigmentation gradually diminished towards the lung base. Note the degree of pigmentation in the superior segment of the lower lobe is the same as the upper lobe. Let me try to summarize the fate of particles within the lung. Small particles may make it to the respiratory bronchioles. In many diseases, the pathology is centered on the respiratory bronchioles. This includes asbestosis, co-workers pneumoconiosis, Langerhans granulomatosis, and centriastner emphysema, 
Rounded particles tend to be removed by lymphatics so that pathologic findings follow a bronchovascular distribution, a sensory acinar distribution along the terminal bronchiole, and a subpleural distribution along the chest wall and fissures. Finally, both deposition and clearance are determined by pulmonary physiology. Round nodules tend to concentrate in the dorsal aspect of the upper lung zones and fibers in the periphery of the lower lung zones. With this basis in the fate of particles, let's now turn our attention to the inorganic dusts. First the fibrous dust asbestos and then the rounded dusts silica and coal. Over 30 million tons of asbestos was used in industry over the last century. Fireproof and of high tensile strength, asbestos is a valuable product in construction. Asbestos is a term used to encompass a range of fibrous silicates, categorized as serpentine, of which chrysotile is the most important commercially, accounting for 90% of asbestos used in North America, and the straight amphibole, of which chrysotilite is the most common member. Unfortunately, all asbestos fibers are capable of producing a wide variety of thoracic manifestations. These manifestations form a crude continuum from effusion to interstitial lung disease. Cellular reactions to asbestos fibers can be demonstrated within hours in laboratory condition. However, clinical disease takes decades to develop. The first manifestation of exposure to asbestos is the pleural effusion occurring within 10 years of exposure. Most are asymptomatic with exudative, often bloody effusions. Most spontaneously resolve within a few months, though some may persist for years. Why effusions resolve is a complete medical mystery. The next pathologic finding is the pleural plaque, seen 10 years later. The pleural plaques tend to develop along the posterior and anterolateral chest wall and the central tendon of the diaphragm. Plaques are often holly leafed shaped along the chest wall or butte shaped when seen in profile. Plaques are usually bilateral, but when unilateral, plaques are more often left sided, and when bilateral, plaques tend to be more severe on the left, as is seen in this example. Plaques are not always seen in the later manifestations of asbestos disease. 20% of those with asbestosis lack plaques, and, and the majority of patients with mesothelioma lack plaques. Asbestosis is dose-related and seen in those with continued prolonged exposure to asbestos fibers. Typical radiographic findings are basilar, peripheral, irregularly shaped reticular opacities in the ILO classification S, T, and U. Fibrosis is associated pathologically with more than a million fibers per gram of lung. Diagnosis is generally a combination of clinical and radiographic findings. Rarely are the individuals biopsied, primarily for legal reasons. Generally, there is no benefit to the patient to risk biopsy. HRCT is more sensitive than the chest radiograph for the detection and characterization of asbestosis. Differential diagnosis for these findings include idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis, drug reactions, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and lymphagetic tumors. For legal reasons, the differentiation between idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and asbestosis is of some importance. Pleural plaques are seen in the majority of those with asbestosis. Of course, those with pre-existing asbestos exposure are not immune from developing idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or the collagen vascular diseases. In addition, 20% of patients with asbestosis lack pleural plaques. Early fibrosis from asbestosis is centered on the respiratory bronchioles. Normally, the respiratory bronchioles are below the limits of resolution of CT. However, with fibrosis, the wall becomes thickened to the point where it is now visible. Both the subpleural curvilinear line, seen in this sagittal reconstruction of the lung, 
and parenchymal bands are much more common in asbestosis than idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Parenchymal bands, however, are seen almost exclusively in those with pleural plaques, making this finding alone less useful. And the subpleural line is a very nonspecific finding in and of itself, as it may be seen in normal individuals and in those with a wide variety of interstitial lung diseases that narrow the small airways. Finally, small peripheral wedge or hump-shaped homogeneous opacities are more common in asbestosis as compared to the same opacities in IPF, where the distal airways are dilated. Again, this probably reflects differences in pathology, where in asbestosis, fibrosis is centered around the small airways, obliterating their lumen, in contrast to IPF, where more peripheral fibrosis results in traction bronchiolectasis of the small airways. Asbestos is an independent risk factor for the development of lung carcinoma, equivalent to that of a heavy smoker. If the exposed individual also smokes, the risk is multiplicative. Nearly one-third of those smokers with asbestosis die of lung cancer. In those with asbestosis, the cancer is more likely to arise in the lower lobes, in contrast to general smokers. Because of the high incidence of lung cancer, this raises the question of whether asbestos-exposed workers with pleural plaques should be screened for lung cancer. Mesothelioma is a rare pleural malignancy seen with asbestos exposure. Curiously, in contrast to this example, the majority have no plaques. Long, thin fibers are more likely to induce mesothelioma. Thus, chrysotile is more neoplastic than chrysotile. The hemithorax is usually small. Pleural effusion is nearly universal. Prognosis is poor with a 12-month median survival. Now let's examine the rounded dusts using silica as our prototype. Silica is the most common element in the Earth's crust. All mining operations, whether iron or coal, contain silica. Sandblasting, foundry work, are common industries for silicosis. Again, there are several different thoracic manifestations from silica exposure, and we will look at each of these briefly. Generally, simple silicosis is asymptomatic and is seen in those workers exposed to relatively low levels of dust. However, simple silicosis is a progressive disease even after removal from the dusty environment. Differential diagnosis for an upper lobe nodular pattern includes the granulomatous diseases, tuberculosis, and sarcoidosis, Langerhans cell granulomatosis, and farmer's lung. Again, like asbestosis, HRCT is more sensitive and better characterizes the parenchymal changes in the lung. Silicosis is centered on pulmonary lymphatics, Thus, silicotic nodules are centered along the bronchovascular bundles, centriacinar portion of the lobule, and in the subpleural lung, where the nodules form the pseudo plaques. Nodules are more profuse in the dorsal aspect of the lung and tend to be more profuse in the right upper lung as compared to similar region on the left. Coal is less fibrogenic than silica. The coal macule as seen in this microscopic path specimen, is centered on the respiratory bronchiole. Coal is also removed by lymphatics. Note the black pleural line and the black line along the major airways. Note on the HRCT image, in addition to the numerous centriastner nodules, that the major fissure is slightly thickened in this patient with coal workers pneumoconiosis. Simple silicosis will eventually evolve into progressive massive fibrosis and is generally defined when nodules coalesce into an aggregate more than one centimeter in diameter. Usually, the process is bilateral, right greater than left, in the dorsal aspect of the lung. PMF is lens-shaped, wide PA and narrow lateral.
the masses gradually migrate towards the hilum. Overall, the whole process looks like a small galaxy. PMF may cavitate, which is problematic because these individuals are at increased risk for tuberculosis. Silica proteinosis is an acute manifestation to overwhelming silica exposure. This usually develops in weeks to months from exposure to high dust concentrations, particularly sandblasting in an enclosed space as we see here. Radiographic findings are typical of alveolar proteinosis, central backwing consolidation, and at HRCT, a geographic pattern of ground glass opacities in intralobular reticular lines, the crazy paving pattern. In contrast to PAP, prognosis is poor with limited response to whole lung lavage. Finally, coal workers with rheumatoid disease may develop nodules even after relatively low exposure to dust. The lesions are typically subpleural. They may grow rapidly, cavitate, and produce a pneumothorax as seen in this patient. Although unusual, Kaplan's may develop in those with asbestos exposure as seen in this patient. In summary, round dusts are handled similarly and tend to concentrate in the upper lung zones. The nodules tend to aggregate along the lymphatics in the bronchovascular bundle, centri lobule, and subpleural venous plexus. Fibers, on the other hand, tend to stay where they are deposited in the lower lung zones. Peripheral reticular fibrosis is the predominant pattern.